Good morning. Thanks for joining us today on World Refugee Day for this webinar titled Beyond Survival, Prioritizing Refugee Mental Health and Psychosocial Support. My name is Ashley Bustillo, and I'm joined by my colleague Bridget McKeon, as well as four incredible panelists who specialize in mental health and psychosocial support from four of Airlink's NGO partners, Israel, MedGlobal, International Medical Corps, and HIAS. Before we get started, I did want to mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website later this week. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please put them in the chat and we can answer some if we have time at the end. World Refugee Day celebrates the strength and courage of people who have been forced to flee their homes. It's a day to build empathy and understanding for their plight and recognize their resilience in rebuilding their lives. This year, World Refugee Day focuses on the power of inclusion and solutions for refugees. The goal of this webinar is to bring awareness to the critical role comprehensive health support programs play in supporting refugee populations and build the capacity of humanitarian actors in rapid onset emergencies and protracted crises. We will be focusing on the importance of mental health and psychosocial support for refugee communities. As we know, emergencies put significant psychological stress on individuals, families, and communities. Forced displacement often breaks down family systems and community networks further exacerbating the stress. We hope that today's webinar will shine a light on the importance of integrating MHPSS approaches in all humanitarian programs. I wanted to start off today's webinar by giving a quick overview of Airlink for those of you who might not be familiar with us. Airlink is a global humanitarian organization that partners with nonprofit partners and more than 50 airlines to deliver critical aid to communities in crisis by providing airlift and logistical solutions with the goal of changing the way the humanitarian community responds to disasters around the world. Throughout our lifetime operations, we have been able to provide more than $20 million in transportation for NGO partners, delivering more than 3 million kilograms of supplies and providing transportation for more than 10,000 responders. Airlink has responded more to more than 120 emergencies and crises all over the world in our lifetime. Before moving on to uh, today's topic, I wanted to set the scene by giving an overview of the global displacement today. Over the last decade, the number of people displaced around the world has gradually increased and now stands at the highest level since records began. Unfortunately, this annual increase is now an annual norm, and according to the UNHCR, at the end of 2022, more than 108 million people around the world were forcibly displaced as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, and human rights violations. Of those, 62 million people are IDPs, 35.3 million are refugees, 5.4 are asylum seekers, and 43.3 million are children. The impacts of violence and climate change have left communities around the world at risk, and more than 40 million people are on the brink of famine. This number obviously worsened by last year's war in Ukraine, ongoing war in Ukraine. UNHCR also estimates that the number of forcibly displaced and stateless people will increase to 117.2 million people by the end of 2023. According to the American Psychiatric Association, about one in every three asylum seekers and refugees experience a high rate of depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder, which is why today's topic is so important. And before we get started with the quick question and answers for our panelists, I'd also like to give an overview of Airlink's impact on the space communities throughout our lifetime. In total, Airlink has reached over 12.3 million refugees and IDPs globally with critical life-saving and life-sustaining care. From initial assessments to emergency response and long-term recovery missions dedicated to supporting refugees, Airlink supported missions have resulted in nearly 4 million people provided with healthcare and WASH, and this includes MHPSS, 3.8 million people provided with food, and 149,000 people provided with shelter and non-food items. Currently, Airlink is proud to be supporting refugee interventions across the world, including in Ukraine, Syria, Bangladesh, Venezuela, and at the U.S.-Mexico border. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Bridget McKeon, and our panelists. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Virgin McKeon, and I am Airlines Humanitarian Program Manager uh, with a focus in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I am just so excited uh, to be introducing our panelists today. We have an excellent group um, of professionals who are focused uh, in the mental health and psychosocial support world. Um, so first, I'm going to start off 
with MedGlobal. Um, so MedGlobal administered psychosocial support in areas to refugees and displaced communities through programs around the world. Uh, they're active in North Aleppo, um, where they support the only mental health hospital, providing care to over 500 uh, people monthly. Uh, and in Lebanon, uh, MedGlobal has a mobile medic, uh, a mobile mental health unit, uh, providing immediate support and referrals for long-term care. Um, we have also worked with them closely on their integrated mental health and psychosocial support services um, as a part of their response in Bangladesh. Um, today with us, we have Dr. Noreen Ahmed, and I want to turn it over to her first uh, to introduce herself briefly. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much to Airlink for all the support you've provided us to be able to get our teams on the ground. Uh, I'm really honored to be here to talk about something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, and as we talk about mental health, um, I really want to kind of start out by saying that that, that mental health is, a, is also about um, talking about our vulnerabilities. And, and so I'll start out just by introducing myself with a little bit of a personal story as to why this is um, so important to me. So uh, my name is Nahreen Ahmed. I'm um, born to Bangladeshi parents uh, who left Bangladesh about over 40 years ago after the effects of a brutal liberation war. Um, and I heard a lot of stories about what conflict did to my family and continue to hear those stories because it's important that there is storytelling. And so that was always really personal to me about the effects of war and conflict on humans, um, not just globally as an organization, but on a personal level and what that does to people. And having been in the field so many times, hearing the stories of refugees and displaced persons, uh, the mental health aspect of what we do is so incredibly important. Um, that said, a little bit about me, I'm a pulmonary and critical care doctor by trade. Uh, and so I will defer to a lot of the clinical stuff to the experts here, but, but a lot of my experience in mental health comes from the field um, and field experience with MedGlobal. I'm uh, born and raised in Philadelphia. And, um, and currently practice at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm the medical director for MedGlobal and have uh, helped launch a lot of our projects, in, mental health projects, especially in countries such as Ukraine, Syria, Bangladesh, uh, Lebanon, uh, and so many more that we continue to, to work on, especially in Latin America be one, being one of our priorities as well. Uh, and I'm just really excited to be here to talk about something that's incredibly important, and I will then uh, turn it back to you, Bridget. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, and I appreciate um, you sharing, and we're so excited to have you here speaking today. Um, switching over now to International Medical Corps. Um, International Medical Corps plays a leading role in the advancement of mental health systems in humanitarian settings. They contribute to the development of global guidelines and national policies for improving mental health and well being among affected populations. And they have been implementing programs integrating mental health into general health care for many years around the world. Um, so from IMC here today, we have Michelle Engels. Michelle, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, so just a brief introduction. I'm a clinical psychologist from Australia, and I was practicing there uh, for 10 years. But in the past 10 years, I've been working in humanitarian settings. So mostly in the Middle East, but also East Africa and the Asia Pacific region. Um, my role currently is as a technical advisor working specifically on the Ukraine regional response for MHPSS. So thanks again for having me. Really important topic. Really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Michelle. All right, next up is ISRAID. Uh, so ISRAID integrates mental health services and post-trauma support into each of their emergency response programs. Uh, they work closely with local actors. Uh, the team regularly establishes child safe spaces to provide immediate relief following a disaster. Um, and they provide psychosocial support to help minimize the impact of long term of in a long term emergency. Uh, so with ISRAID, we have Abitel Furlager here with us today. Abitel, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Thanks, Rizud. Uh, my name is Abitel, and I have been working with Israel for a number of years um, in the protection team. Um, my background is in mental health counseling and also in dance movement therapy. And I began work sort of on the side of humanitarian aid. I started working more with resettlement populations in Chicago, um, working as a mental health clinical practitioner with Heartland Alliance in Chicago. And Later, I came to Israel and 
um, actually connected with Israel through the University of Haifa, where I teach, and collaborated with them on some programs that they did um, together with the School for the Creative Arts Therapies. And as time went on, became more and more involved in the programs. I'm really excited to be here and to be a part of this, this discussion. Thank you so much for inviting us and for hosting this. Thank you so much, Abidal. All right, last but not least, we have HIAS. Uh, HIAS administers community-based mental health programs across 14 countries, specifically in Venezuela. Uh, the mental health and psychosocial support programs are one of their core areas of work. Um, HIAS Venezuela runs community support programs and ensures access to intensive mental health support for all displaced individuals. Uh, with HIAS, we have Glacia Pereira. Um, Glacia, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you. Uh, well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Glaucia Pereda. I'm the Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Technical Advisor for Central America and the Caribbean at HIAS. I have been supporting MHPSS programs in HIAS uh, since five years ago. And in general, my, my experience in humanitarian settings has been very diverse. I support, as you mentioned, the Venezuela response, but also I mentioned the response to Venezuelan migrants and refugees around the region in Aruba, Guyana, Mexico. And recently, I support also Honduras with a flood emergency and the Ukraine response. So I'm very pleased to be here with all of you sharing uh, the, the and sharing this all this experience regarding the, the refugees and immigrants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gracia. All right. Um, so next we are moving on to the panel portion of the webinar. Um, and I am going to jump right in. Uh, the first question I think. Avital, you might be able to speak to directly based on your uh, perspective from the protection team, um, but I also want to open it up to all of uh, the rest of the panelists. So in a rapidly evolving emergency situation, which um, all of us participate in, where immediate life-saving interventions are prioritized, how can emergency response professionals ensure the integration of psychosocial support into the response framework? Um, I'm happy to start the response, and I'd love to also obviously hear what others have to say, because this is quite the um, gathering. But um, I think one of the most important things is really understanding um, the approach. So even as we're coming in and offering aid that often is about meeting physical needs, at the same time, there needs to be a very humanistic approach to the way we interact and speak with people. Um, one of our sort of foundational um, interventions in psychosocial support, which is integrated into all of our emergency responses, is something we call the three R's, which is to, which is meant to be a guiding light to help people as they're in the shoes of response. So it's to reduce stress, to restore a sense of safety, and to help regulate emotions. Um, and I think that these are actually things that we as human beings do naturally with each other. Um, if we think about any kind of situation where like a friend calls us, they just had a car accident or they've gone through something, we would naturally do these types of things for people who we're close to. We would help to, to reduce their stress. We would help to restore their sense of safety. We, we would help to regulate their emotions. Um, sometimes when you're facing someone who is going through something very difficult and they're not someone who you know or who you're close with, you can have those emotions or those feelings sort of um, come onto you. And as a practitioner, you need to find a way to stay in your center. And so we always try to say to people, try to just remember these three basic things, which are really simple and that people can do naturally. Um, when you're when you're working with people, but to, to really have um, the humanistic and um, the approach, which really is about listening to people and meeting their needs and seeing them as part of the way that we respond to them. I mean, that's sort of in a nutshell, um, but I'd love to hear what other people have to say as well. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll open it back up. Oh, yes, Glacia, please. Thank you. I also think that one key answer to, to this question is that life-saving intervention are MHPSS. 
this is not something separate from mental health and psychosocial support. If we understand uh, the concept and the intervention that this approach and this sector includes, we will recognize that MHPSS is multi-layer support. So usually people in emergencies will have emotional reactions to a losses, violent destruction, but the first level of support should be the access to this life savings intervention. The thing is that the way we provide the life saving intervention should be in a way that promote mental health and psychosocial well being. So the access to this vaccine service should include uh, the promotion of the dignity. Should be uh, should it should have an access in a safe way, and also should be cultural uh, appropriate. I mean, this should fit with the local values of the populations that we are assisting in an emergency. And when we provide this first level of support, the access to food, water, shelter, IG-19, protection, we will do, we will for sure have an impact on mental health well-being of the people that is affected in an emergency. And of course, there are other levels of support, uh, for example, the strain in the community and families, and also providing focus, not specialized support and also providing a specialized support that are also part of the MHPSS interventions and response. But in this sense, what we should do uh, is to advocate about the importance to also strain the capacities and the skills of families and communities mm -hmm. to deal with the stress and to cope with the situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, some really good points, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, yes. Yeah, I, I was going to say much of the same thing, you know, um, coming from a, a background of, um, you know, a, of being a non mental health practitioner. Um, it's more and more obvious to me as I practice medicine, that we often separate the two into um, what we call our general medical interventions, and then what everybody in, in a hospital setting will separate out as somebody who might need psychosocial support. Uh, the, you know, the more I work in, in uh, refugee camps and, and with displaced persons, those two cannot be separated. Um, and, and as Garcia mentioned, I, I mean, it is life-saving. In, in fact, you know, if we don't address those things, we can't address the, the physical health either. Those two, physical and mental health, are just two components of health, um, and they really should not be separated out. And, and secondarily, I think that uh, as we have this conversation, it's really important that we advocate that the organizations that are providing grants and funds um, for emergency response should really ensure that they continue to increase the requirements for MHPSS support as a part of proposals. Um, you know, and to really, you know, GBV has been brought up a lot, but I think really including MHPSS as a whole as a part of the grant process will really ensure to your question that um, that we're that we're putting the responsibility on emergency response organizations like ourselves um, to include that in our response as a, as a baseline requirement. Very interesting, thank you. And then Michelle, if you wanna to close out this question. Yeah, probably don't have a whole lot to add above and beyond what everyone said, but just absolutely, there is no help without mental health. And I think one of the core things we tried to do to ensure that there's at least psychosocial considerations in response to an emergency is to make sure that other sector staff are trained on something like psychological first aid so that they know how to respond supportively to persons in distress. And more importantly, they know how to refer and link persons in need with appropriate refer like re appropriate support systems. Um, so we found that to be incredibly effective. I think there is a lot of advocacy sometimes that needs to be done, you know, with donors to try and really emphasize that there is a mental health need. Um, we have seen less of that. You know, when you look at the Ukraine crisis, it has really been highlighted as a mental health emergency, um, which is quite unique. You know, I haven't seen that before working in this field where it really has been front and center. Um, so I do think it's changing somewhat in terms of the donor landscape. Um, but I do think it's also very important for us, you know, when an emergency is just starting to have a real considered approach to mental health programming. So when we're doing needs assessments, obviously making sure it's coordinated with other actors in, in that country, but also making sure that we include mental health and psychosocial support aspects within those assessments, because that's going to help us to develop more informed programming. Thank you so much. 
Um, moving on to the next question, I actually want to, um, Michelle, you might be able to speak on this first this time um, based on um, IMC's perspective. Um, but how can mental health and psychosocial support programs be effectively tailored to meet the diverse cultural and contextual needs of a refugee population? Great question. I love this question because I think so often we kind of plug and play interventions or there's a temptation to do that, you know, because we see something that works really well in one country and we want to go, yeah, let's do this now in Ukraine. It makes sense. Um, but it just doesn't work like that. You know, we're working with humans. Humans are always different. They're diverse. I think it's really important first step to go into a country, acknowledge that you're a foreigner, acknowledge that you're not an expert on the culture you were there to learn to listen and to really learn from that community about what they want about what they need about how they understand mental health um, and that's going to give you a lot of rich information you know and this is why with International Medical Corps we always come in with a rapid MHPSS assessment to help us understand how people exhibit distress, what type of coping strategies they normally use, what are some of their barriers maybe to accessing services that might exist, and that's what helps us to kind of contextually adapt our programming. You know, when we look at established mental health manualized programs, like something like Problem Management Plus, which is an organization, um, a World Health Organization scalable psychological intervention, we can't just put that into a new country and into each and every country and assume that it's always going to work. We have to go through a process of talking through the intervention with community members, with our staff who are from the community themselves, and just make sure it makes sense, change it, change the pictures, change the dialogue, change the terminology. So really using the expertise of the community as much as possible. I appreciate that flexibility and listening to the community to see what they need. Um, Dr. Ahmed, yes, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I agree that uh, this particular question is so important in every intervention um, and really tailoring what we do in any country to the community. And I love what Michelle said about, you know, about really listening. And I think, you know, I, I laugh because we talk about localization so much in, in the NGO world, and I don't think it's practice really. Um, but this, this is where, you know, it really has to be, we have to be strict about practicing that idea of localization, field-led, community-led, and thinking about, you know, why is there stress and crisis happening here? Thinking about the different stages of that. And I learned that a lot working with the Rohingya community, that there is the pre-migration phase, the migration phase, post-migration and then this concept of integration and every phase of those comes with a different psychosocial stress and creates mm -hmm. more crisis and more conflict within the community. And I think understanding each of the phases, you know, and for Ukraine, it was what was happening pre-war. There was always a level of stress that this was a possibility. Now what's happening during the war? And then what about the fears of what's going to happen after and where are people resettling? I mean, the, you know, the the aspect of the psychosocial stressors are so different in every country, um, and we absolutely cannot ignore that at all. And I think the plug and the the days of plug and play are long over. Um, but it's always a great to have a framework. But I think really um, modifying that and getting to getting community leaders where we're working to really mm -hmm. be the ones to inform us um, is so so important and has been a huge reason for success in a lot of our countries where where we're implementing MH, MHPSS. Thank you. Yes, very good points. Uh, Gracia, please. Thank you. Uh, I agree with all uh, all my partners here in the meeting. And also, I think that, um, as they mentioned, one of the key principles of a community-based MHPSS approach is to promote the community participation in all phases of, of the programming and all phases of the um, humanitarian response. So in this sense, um, the need assessment, the needs and resource assessment is key because we cannot design a MHPSS program without knowing and identifying what are the real needs in terms of mental health and psychosocial support of the participants of these programs, right? So what, that's one of the key things. And also I think that in a community-based MHPSS approach, 
the object is not to provide direct services, direct mental health services, mm -hmm. as we are the experts and we are going to, you know, deliver psychologists in all the field to provide psychosocial support. That's not the main objectives of a community-based approach. The main objectives is to identify what are the cultural practices, what are the traditional ways of healing and recovering of these communities that maybe because of the emergency, it has been it disrupted. And now how we can help to restore these practicals and these uh, traditional activities that they used to heal? What are their grief rituals? What are their ways that they support each other and how we as organization can support them so they can restore these activities and, and strain their psychosocial support skills? Mm, yeah, that's flipping that fr framework is really interesting. Uh, Avital, yes, please. Um, so I'm not going to add a lot because um, everything that has been said, I, I agree with. And I, I, I would just say that um, aside from really trying to, to focus on working locally and within the community, I think there's um, a big importance, at least in our experience, about really looking at perception um, and the perceptions of the way the culture and the community the well-being. Um, sometimes it's not really even like mental health is sometimes a concept, but sometimes it's not in just terminologies and and really trying to to connect and find um, the way in so that there's an openness towards wanting to have that be something that is promoted and supported. Um, so. I feel like the place of perception and and connecting to how cultures and communities perceive their own well-being, individual well-being, and taking that um, deeply into consideration is really important. Yes, thank you. Uh, the next question I have actually, I think, is is a natural segue, especially to what Glacio you were speaking about before. Um, but what are some successful examples of community-based approaches and mental health and psychosocial support programs for refugees? And how do they promote resilience and social cohesion within displaced communities? So Glacia, if you wanna expand a little bit about what you were talking about before um, and do other members of the panel want to uh, touch on this? Yes, sure. Well, in Hayas, we have many successful examples of community-based approaches. Uh, in MHPSS, but particularly in this uh, panel, I want to highlight an experience that we had in Haya Saruba. Uh, Haya Saruba received a big percent of migrants and refugees from Venezuela. And most of them, uh, the situation in Aruba is very difficult because they used to be isolated. They used to have feelings of sadness, anxiety, and distress because they used to be persecuted and, and they used to be um, in isolation because of they are afraid of the tension and the deportation. I mean, usually the authorities in Aruba don't respect their rights as refugees and migrants, and they used to be isolated. So uh, the Hayas Aruba team uh, recently uh, developed a program aimed for children that is called the Week of the Little Ones of the Little Yeah the Week of the Little Ones that uh, is aimed to support children's migrants and refugee children that used to be isolated through cultural activities, sports, and art activities. So in consultation with the children, uh, the team identified that for the sport component, the children want to do basket games. So in, in this uh, program, the children in a local sport club play this game basket with local children. I mean, we used to integrate both. The, I mean, you know that the game has two teams, but the teams are integrated with local children, but and also with refugee immigrants. And these activities used to help uh, children to integrate more with the local community and to decrease the level of discrimination and xenophobia. 
and also with the support of our MHPSS officers in these sport activities, we also provide a psychoeducation and we also highlight the positive values of solidarity and teamwork. So it has been proved to be very benefit, not just in terms of physical health that it is because they are doing exercise, they are secreting uh, neurotransmitters, but also in terms of their social cohesion. The other part of the of this program is uh, art. So we encourage children to express their different fears through art, especially through painting. And uh, the MHPSS officers that support these programs also uh, try to help children to identify what the, what are their emotions, what this means and try to uh, help them to learn some skills so they know how to manage emotion. This also uh, is good for the integration of local children and migrants and refugee children as they used to, to share and identify that they can have common fears that they are not different human beings. We are all human beings and we can all have uh, similar emotions. And the last part of the program, it has a cultural component, and this includes a tour of Aruba's historical sites. So usually with the support of volunteers from the local communities, usually teachers, um, they, so they provide like a history, they provide history of each of these key sites in Aruba and the MHPSS officers also highlight the positive values of the activity and the commonalities and similarities between two cultures because in this uh, cultural part of the program we also, we also used to talk about uh, the Venezuelan's historical sites so they can meet each other, they can start like uh, thinking about the similarities, the common things that we have in two cultures. So in general, uh, this program is considered uh, a successful experience as children has the opportunity to socialize with others. This has an impact on their well-being, they are learning skills, and also uh, they are um, um, improving their social cohesion with the local community. Thank you so much for sharing. That's a really interesting program uh, and helpful to provide context uh, for what those programs look like in action. Um, I think, Michelle, you had your hand up next. Yeah, thank you. I just love that example that was just provided because it's so comprehensive and such a clear example of community-based programming. And I think what's really interesting is, you know, in Europe, what's very common is for there to be a volunteer type model where the host community volunteers to support refugee communities. And we do know that there are benefits to that and that can certainly help with social cohesion. What I think is really powerful is when you can get the two groups together more in an equal footing where there is not a power or a potential power imbalance. So activities like was what was mentioned before in terms of sports, getting people on teams together and then, you know, engaging in some type of physical activity. One thing that we've done with International Medical Corps is supporting like community kitchens where we bring together host community um, and the displaced community together. They share food. You know, there's something very um, nice about bringing people together over a common and shared interest. Um, another example of community-based programming that we've done that works really well in Ukraine um, is there is a particular WHO program, again, called Self-Help Plus, where you can train someone. They don't have to be a mental health pro professional, but you can train them and supervise them to deliver a group-based psychosocial support intervention where they learn effective coping strategies, things like that. Um, and so we implemented that through our Ukrainian staff and people really connected with the material and then said, please train us so that we can train our community members. And that was fantastic. So we had community members training their own community on coping strategies, well-being, um, and we found that that was really successful and that really took off. It, it meant that we didn't have to have a presence everywhere because it was actually owned by the community and taken up and championed by them. Um, so community-based MHPSS is extremely important. Yeah, that's a really, really cool example of uh, the, the community engagement. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, if you want to go next. 
Yeah, I actually was going to add the example of, um, uh, of you know, our, our organization, Med Globals, is a lot of capacity building, and uh, and we've realized that the the model of training community health workers or community uh, and and um, paraprofessionals, you know, and as well as those who just are not are not necessarily mental health clinicians is so important because worldwide there's a staffing shortage of mental health practitioners and recognizing that there are ways to provide support through um, you know, non-mental health professionals at the community level is really, really important. Uh, and as the complexity rises on kind of understanding the different layers of psychosocial support that can be provided from a community level to then um, requiring maybe uh, clinician supervision or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, think, I, I think involving uh, those kinds of practices has been really, really successful for a lot of organizations that we also partner with. Um, you know, there's an organization called Me We International who works in several different parts of the world. Who has a, a and what's one of they're one of our um, partners and and they have a phenomenal model where they go into the community and they train community leaders and um, and then really advocate for there being a systemic approach um, to to this and, and scaling up so that the number of people that can provide mental health support increases over a certain amount of time. Um, and so they, you know, they'll set maybe one or two year plan in order to train up an X number of people so that they have a cadre of mental health providers um, within the within a vulnerable community, which is just such an excellent model um, and shows a lot of commitment, I think, and which is really mm -hmm. big, a big part of these, these models is that we're showing that we should be showing the community that there is commitment long term, um, that this isn't just there was an emergency, let's come in. Um, and you know, this is what we saw in Syria after the earthquake, where our first layer was going in and providing and, and training people for um, to provide psychosocial first aid, psychological first aid. And then after that came some of the other themes that were coming up as far as long term or chronic issues that were in the in the arena of mental health and talking about things like substance use and bringing that up in, in a lot of different places and kind of showing that that we have a commitment to not only the acute response, but but long-term and creating that capacity within the community. Yeah, that's a really good example of sustainability, how you keep these programs going even after uh, the primary intervention has, has left. Um, Avital, yes, please. You can also expand. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add another example. These, these have all been really, really wonderful examples. And I was actually thinking about refugee communities and especially communities on the move where sometimes it's people who don't know each other and they're not really prior to the current situation. They haven't been a community in the past. And um, I can think of a, of a really um, interesting example that, um, that happened when we were working in the refugee crisis in Greece. And we were working in a shelter and all of the women were with children. All of the children were outside of any kind of um, structure or framework. And none of them were speaking with each other. Like everyone was sort of in their own little um, component. And there was a lot of isolation. Um, and we really wanted to find a way to, to create connection. And we started um, first by literally knocking on each, each door and slowly gathering the women together. And then we brought in, um, we came in and trained the mothers to, to offer early childhood education to their own children. And we opened an early childhood education center within the shelter and the different mothers took turns on different days to lead it. Um, and what we saw happen was they started to collaborate with each other. They started to work together as a community. There was a lot of limbo. They didn't know how long they were gonna be staying there. They didn't know where their next move was, but there was something about saying, okay, but here we are right now. And right now we are together. So can, can there be connection and can there be support? And it really changed the experience of those women because they started to feel that they did have support and that they were connected and that, and the children as well suddenly had much more um, of a holding environment, um, which also helped them to be able to learn, to be able to interact with each other. So that's just an example from like another angle where the community maybe isn't 
um, already in existence and how to nonetheless allow for community to be created within those types of settings. Yeah, thank you. And that's interesting, the role that your organization would play in providing the structure and the framework, but again, who uh, is actually carrying out the, the, the connections and, and the sustainability is the community themselves. So thank you for that. Um, I want to talk shift gears a little bit, but still talking about uh, different types of programs, interventions that um, organizations may provide for mental health and psych psychosocial support. Um, and maybe addressing this one first to Dr. Ahmed. Um, so in the context of mobile mental health care, what strategies and approaches have proven effective in reaching and engaging refugee communities, particularly those who may face barriers in accessing traditional mental health care? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think the first uh, I want to say Avital maybe brought this up, the um, question, the issue of perception. Um, you know, starting there, when it comes to the mobile medical teams in general, um, these are basically med medical units that go from camp to camp or location, different location to location and um, with it within a particular country. And I think what's so important is recognizing some of those perception barriers to uh, obtaining mental health. So first is building trust. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I, I, as far as the specific programming, we really have to gain the trust of the community to want to come and talk and share. And so that means that this has to be community led, which is our usual goal that all of our staff that are in mobile medical units are from the community. And so they either share a similar, um, you know, similar, they are in a similar situation or they have similar stories or they share the values, the culture, the language, which is so important, um, you know, avoiding the use of translators, especially in the setting of mental health, things like that, you know, and, um, and so that's really where it starts is understanding what's, you know, for me, culturally, as a South Asian, you know, I understand the idea of stigma behind even seeking mental health. Um, and, and so starting with some of that is really important in breaking that down. And then going into the actual programmatic side, I think it's a matter of recognizing where in the timeline of a crisis or conflict are we, um, you know, with Syria and the earthquake, uh, immediately after the earthquake, it was psychological recovery that we addressed. Um, and, and so that similarly in Ukraine, as we launch our mobile medical units in eastern Ukraine, actually this week, I'm heading there later today, um, flying out that way to hopefully um, oversee some of that. And the discussion has been, you know, how do we create the these mobile health, mobile mental health programs? And the first is that our staff of our implementing partner in eastern Ukraine will basically, their staff will get trained. Um, so a very similar approach that I had mentioned in the last question, which is, um, we're training our local staff to provide that initial mental health um, consultation and then with um, access to referral pathways so uh, so that we know if there are issues of domestic abuse, um, GBV, things like that, that might come up or abuse in camps, that there's a referral pathway that our initial person that's a part of the mobile medical unit can then refer them um, to a higher level uh, or a safe space where they can go. Um, and then secondarily is to ensure that um, that our that our staff are fully trained, they know when to recognize an emergency, um, and then really just the idea of talking about the importance of mental health. Secondly, um, I just want to mention this because I'm not sure if it comes up in the other questions, but uh, as it comes up with the idea of addressing mental health in general, I think sometimes we, when we talk about the community, we're talking about, um, for lack of a better word, I suppose, the civilian community, but the mental health practitioners, the healthcare workers themselves, um, I think including them in the overarching community is also really important. So when we talk about mobile medical units, you know, it's maybe not necessarily a part of that, but just a part of MHPSS in general and addressing the community health workers, the healthcare workers in general that are um, that are constantly at risk of stress uh, and, and psychosocial stressors and kind of including that into the MHPSS programming, uh, ensuring that we talk about burnout was an interesting thing that came up from um, the Ukrainian healthcare workers, but but really the and ensuring that the context is correct. So that's probably in and that that particular point is applicable to mobile medical units and any of our MHPSS programming is that the context and um, is correct, that the clinical context, cultural context is correct. For instance, I'll end with this example. Um, and while it's not necessarily relevant to mobile medical unit, it's relevant to just context. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, 
talking about burnout with um, Ukrainian healthcare workers, they said, you know, don't tell us to go uh, get a massage or do this. You know, some of the things as a U.S. doctor, when they talk about burnout in hospitals, it's like, oh, we created a room for you to go have quiet space quiet time. Um, and that's maybe not a possibility or a reality or even relevant. And and nor is it very sensitive of a response um, to burnout when it comes to healthcare workers in Ukraine versus healthcare workers in the US. So really understanding that the context of what we're talking about and what we're recommending, um, and even these modules that we teach, like really have to have that clinical relevance and that cultural relevance. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. And it's really interesting, the the ties between cultural relevance when we're talking about um, the communities that are impacted, um, but also that includes health co-workers on top of that. Thanks for that. Is there anyone else who wants to touch on this topic or we can move on to the next question? Yes, please, Michelle. I would just say really quickly to add on to that, um, you know, one thing that I found with mobile medical clinics is that there's no one size fits all approach. And I think one thing that's really important is for the community to know that you will be returning regularly, especially if MHPS as is supposed to be offered, um, because one off or like one shot interventions we know are not effective and can actually heighten distress. So making sure if you're doing a mobile medic team to let the community know that we will be here regularly on this day at this time so that they can start to anticipate and also start to get to know and establish that trust as well, which is so essential. One of the things we try to do to engage with the community when we're doing mobile clinics is to also look at any kind of existing structures in the locality where community is naturally gathering and trying to kind of integrate a little bit within that. So we start to kind of mention, well, we have a mobile clinic, you know, we talk about what types of services and supports available there. And it looks so different depending on the context. You know, sometimes it's a primary health care clinic or a small little um, health care hub in a, in a community. Sometimes it could just be, you know, a building that's like semi um, destroyed but still is solid enough for community members to gather and for whatever reason they're gathering there informally and so we use that as a point to kind of connect with community members so I think again it's that importance of being really flexible to the context to identify how to make that mobile medical unit meaningful and really make sure that you are connecting with the community. Because often the ones that are most vulnerable and most in need of support are generally less visible and less difficult, more difficult to access. Um, so that outreach component is so important. Yeah, that's really good points, thank you. Uh, the next question I have, um, I'm going to open it up to everyone first, um, because I think everyone has slightly touched on this, but how can partnerships and collaborations between humanitarian organizations, local stakeholders, and the refugee community strengthen the implementation and impact of mental health and psychosocial support programs? I know there's a lot of talk about uh, the connection between humanitarian organizations and the community. But thinking about all other types of partnerships um, in, in a program, I, I think it would be helpful to hear your perspective on. Yes, please, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, we tend to partner very closely with ministries of health because we are predominantly a medical organization. So we work very closely with local ministries in order to ensure that mental health is integrated within primary health care. And that's been a really effective model because if the Ministry of Health at the country level is really championing mental health integration, you have more of a chance of sustainable change. You know, once IMC up and leaves, you've got a group of champions who have been involved from the beginning and who have been leading from the beginning. Um, so that's been really essential for us. I think it was mentioned at some point as well, the concept of localization. Um, and I think humanitarian organizations in general, we need to do better at this because it's so important. Um, and I think we've learned a lot, you know, especially in recent responses, we've learned a lot, but there's still some way to go. Uh, but when we look at, you know, local organizations, there is already so much expertise, like especially looking at Ukraine, there's so much expertise in country, there's so much knowledge in country and capacity. Um, and it's really, 
harmful actually to have a host of you know international organizations you know come in and, and start up from scratch and and disregard that local expertise um, so really engaging with local NGOs and putting them in the driver's seat. I think it can be common sometimes for international organizations to treat partnerships as more like implementing partners. Um, so we have this project, please can you implement? But that's not a meaningful partnership. Really what we need to do is say, okay, you guys are the expert, help guide us. What can we do? How can it be done? Um, and really give the ownership to them because at the end of the day, they are the ones who will be taking it forward. So much. Uh, yes, Avital. Yeah, maybe just to continue some of what Michelle already said, um, also Ministry of Health, but because we tend to do a lot of programming also for children, we also try to collaborate as much as possible with the Ministry of Education whenever it's possible. It's not always possible, but when but when we can and try to really work within the system so that um, the school, the teachers, the leaders in the schools are able to integrate a, an approach that's looking at the at children and their families and their environments at large and seeing um, that psychosocial well-being is something that the school and the environment can provide. Um, so that that's something that I think that we really try to do. And the other thing that's coming up in my mind is also that obviously every context is really different. And so there's always um, in, in the beginning of the understanding what's happening on the ground and listening to the community, trying to understand who are the formal leaders, but also who are the non-formal leaders and trying to also give those like non-formal leaders the leadership roles that they have within the community um, by engaging them to be sort of leaders in in these areas for their communities. Um, and like, I'm not giving something specific because every time it really is different. Um, so, but, but yeah, like also really trying to look at the informal systems that exist within a community that can often be very significant. Very interesting, thank you. And Dr. Ahmed? Yeah, I was actually going to say the same thing. Um, the the regarding uh, community leaders, you know, working with the Ministry of Health is like de de definitely so important um, for that idea of sustainability, uh, absorbing, getting, having programs get absorbed back into the national structure, pushing for it to be a part of primary health care. Um, so there's so many layers to this, um, you know, from the government level, the local health department layer, and then and then local leaders. Um, and I think something that is really important in a lot of the countries that we work in, especially is religious leaders, um, you know, having, uh, ha and this is seen in health also, that when you have um, religious leaders kind of support and and show support to these kinds of interventions, it, it's it's more likely because it's somebody that people trust um, and they and that that's so important uh, to partner with the leaders of a community um, and especially you know religious leaders depending on the relevance and where in the world that, that we might be operating and and that that's that's truly an important part of um, of the, just the messaging um, and then I think. Um, um, you know, we there was a mention of uh, children, and I don't know if we have. I know we didn't get a chance to delve in, into this too much, but um, but but I fully agree that you know involving teachers, the educational the educational space in discussing how to provide safe spaces and safety for children and ensuring that their rights are protected, um, and really also you know the other thing is is engaging the. Um, the the world of arts and and is also so important in the space of mental health um because i think it's it is just something that provides a platform for people to express what what they're feeling what they're going through and i think that there isn't enough value in that uh, or rather there isn't enough um perceived value in that and i think it's so important to to incorporate that so just a few ways that i think um in, implementing from different angles uh and util, utilizing di different organizations is so important Thank you. And yeah, it, it's a it's a good point that <laughs> there's there's so much to discuss when it comes to this topic and we are nearly up on time and I want to be conscious of that. Um, but while we have uh, such 
um, a great amount of expertise on the panel here today. I just want to open it up for any last comments that you guys might have um, to close out this session. Any anything that we might not have gotten to through the questions? Yeah, please, Dr. Armin. Um, it's not a question so much as a um, just a, a statement, but you know, I think I've I've seen so many amazing programs in in the communities that we work with, um, and you know. <sighs> over and over again, it's it's like funding is always the issue. And I know that, you know, it's something that we all incorporate, you know, all face sometimes. And um, I think that that is the key here that there has to be more in the pot of funding for mental health um, to get these programs started to ensure that they're sustainable. Uh, because it is that is where um, that is a weak point, I think, in the NGO world right now in the humanitarian aid world, where there just isn't enough funding that's being put forward towards mental health. I do think that that's a trend that's changing. But you know, just that's, that's just my sort of plug to advocate for um, increased uh, increased support for a lot of the programs that we talked about today, because they're so crucially important. Thank you so much. Yeah, excellent points. Yes, please, Michelle. Yeah, I love that. I think funding is so crucial. And we also, you know, like to emphasize the importance of multi-year funding, ideally, where possible. And the reason being is because MHPSS is, is complicated. You know, it really isn't a one shot. It isn't something that you can do in three months and then you leave and it's sorted. It's something that takes time. It's complicated. There's different phases of an emergency which has different psychological symptoms and distress associated to it. Um, so we know that mental health needs are long term. And so ideally funding needs to be as well. <laughs> and attached to that, I think it's also really important to keep that lens on supportive supervision of staff as well. You know, and that's so that's a call to donors, but it's also a call to practitioners as well. So MHPSS programs rely on their staff heavily. You know, we're we're a human focused sector, so to speak. Um, so that means that we really need to invest in our staff. We need to really make sure that we're supporting them to do quality work. And we also need to support their well being as much as possible. We have a responsibility and imperative to do that. Um, so I think it's really important when we talk about MHPSS programming that we do include an emphasis on supportive supervision to make sure that our staff are also cared for and that they're given the support that they need to do the best quality work. Thank you. That's an excellent point. Uh, yes, happy come. Um, I think I'll, all of these are incredible points. I think I'll just add one piece that I that I think is really important, um, which is that like we always talk about mental health and psychosocial support together, and they are very um, clearly intertwined. I think sometimes when we take psychosocial support and look at psychosocial well-being as a right of birth for every human being, <laughs> like, that we should all be able to have um, the ability to develop regardless of our age, not just for children and to be, to have overall well-being be part of our experience. I think that is one way to sort of try to interweave um, this MHPSS into programs at large. Um, and. I think sometimes mental health and just those words can be scary or off-putting to people. And I think sometimes when it's sort of reframed in a way that people can sort of digest it maybe a little bit easier, sometimes it, it creates a little more openness towards it. Um, so I just wanted to add that piece. Thank you so much. It's been great to listen to all of these wonderful sharings and I really appreciate being invited. Thank you, Abby Tal. That's a great, great, great point. Thank you. Uh, Glacia, I'm going to give you the last word then. Yeah, I will be very quickly because I know that the time ends. But I just want uh, to highlight uh, one important point uh, for all the people that is hearing us in this panel is to understand that we should um, avoid pathologizing the emotional, the cognitive, and the behavioral reactions of people affected by emergencies. As we know that most of these reactions are natural, are expected, and will improve over their time as normalcy and access to basic services, protection, and community support are reestablished. 
So I think this is a, a very important point. Uh, we shouldn't uh, consider that everyone that goes through an emergency has a trauma or a post-traumatic stress disorder. Most of these reactions are normal, uh, to, are normal reactions to abnormal events. And also to uh, a lesson that I think we we highlight in these conversations is the importance of the community participation in all phases of the programming. It's really, really important to train the community leaders on a scalable psychological intervention or PFA, train the stakeholder in psychosocial skills so they can be able to support the response. And this also will guarantee the sustainability of our program. And finally, I think that another point that it will be, it will have more relevance through time is um, the self-care and the care of the mental health of the staff that provide these services. So this is a relevant issue that through time, I think we will start talking more. And um, yeah, I just want to highlight these points. Thank you. Thank you so much, Garcia, and everyone else on the panel. Um, to close out, um, I want to first thank our participants for joining today. Um, as we conclude the webinar, I hope that um, everyone takes the lessons learned uh, and the shared responsibility to advocate for comprehensive mental health support for refugees with them. Um, and then finally, thank you to our panelists. Um, your valuable insights, your expertise, and dedication has made this event very enlightening and inspirational. Um, your contributions have reinforced uh, integrating mental health and psychosocial support into humanitarian responses um, and have inspired at least me <laughs> to work uh, towards more sustainable solutions. Um, I, I think that the knowledge gained um, will continue to foster collaboration and drive positive change into the in the field. Um, so thank you so, so, so much for joining. Uh, happy World Refugee Day to everyone. And um, yeah, I hope you have a nice rest of your evening. <laughs>